Motive versus opportunity. Mr. Patharic cleared his throat rather more importantly than usual. I am afraid my little problem will seem rather tame to you all, he said apologetically, after the sensational stories we have been hearing. There is no bloodshed in mine, but it seems to me an interesting and rather ingenious little problem, and fortunately I am in a position to know the right answer to it. It isn't terribly legal, is it? asked Joyce Lumpier. I mean points of law and lots of Barnaby v. Skinner in the year 1881, and things like that. Mr. Patharic beamed appreciatively at her over his eyeglasses. No, no, my dear young lady. You need have no fears on that score. The story I am about to tell is a perfectly simple and straightforward one and can be followed by any layman. It concerns a former client of mine. I will call him Mr. Claude, Simon Claude. He was a man of considerable wealth and lived in a large house not very far from here. He had had one son killed in the war and this son had left one child, a little girl. Her mother had died at her birth, and on her father's death she had come to live with her grandfather who at once became passionately attached to her. Little Chris could do anything she liked with her grandfather. I have never seen a man more completely wrapped up in a child, and I cannot describe to you his grief and despair when, at the age of eleven, the child contracted pneumonia and died. Poor Simon Claude was inconsolable. A brother of his had recently died in poor circumstances and Simon Claude had generously offered a home to his brother's children, two girls, Grace and Mary, and a boy, George. But though kind and generous to his nephew and nieces, the old man never expended on the many of the love and devotion he had accorded to his little grandchild. Employment was found for George Claude in a bank nearby, and Grace married a clever young research chemist of the name of Philip Garand. Mary, who was a quiet, self-contained girl, lived at home and looked after her uncle. She was, I think, fond of him in her quiet undemonstrative way. And to all appearances things went on very peacefully. I may say that after the death of little Cristobal, Simon Claude came to me and instructed me to draw up a new will. By this will, his fortune, a very considerable one, was divided equally between his nephew and nieces, a third share to each. Time went on. Chancing to meet George Claude one day I inquired for his uncle, whom I had not seen for some time. To my surprise George's face clouded over. I wish you could put some sense into Uncle Simon, he said ruefully. His honest but not very brilliant countenance looked puzzled and worried. This spirit business is getting worse and worse. What spirit business? I asked, very much surprised. Then George told me the whole story. How Mr. Claude had gradually got interested in the subject and how on the top of this interest he had chanced to meet an American medium, a Mrs. Eurydice Sprague. This woman, whom George did not hesitate to characterize as an out-and-out -out swindler, had gained an immense ascendancy over Simon Claude. She was practically always in the house and many seances were held in which the spirit of Cristobal manifested itself to the doting grandfather. I may say here and now that I do not belong to the ranks of those who cover spiritualism with ridicule and scorn. I am neither a believer nor an unbeliever. On the other hand, spiritualism lends itself very easily to fraud and imposture, and from all young George Claude told me about this Mrs. Eurydice Sprague I felt more and more convinced that Simon Claude was in bad hands and that Mrs. Sprague was probably an imposter of the worst type. The old man, shrewd as he was in practical matters, would be easily imposed on where his love for his dead grandchild was concerned. Turning things over in my mind I felt more and more uneasy. I was fond of the young Claus, Mary, and George, and I realized that this Mrs. Sprague and her influence over their uncle might lead to trouble in the future. At the earliest opportunity I made a pretext for calling on Simon Claude. I found Mrs. Sprague installed as an honored and friendly guest. As soon as I saw her my worst apprehensions were fulfilled. She was a stout woman of middle age, dressed in a flamboyant style. Very full of cant phrases about our dear ones who have passed over, and other things of the kind. Her husband was also staying in the house, Mr. Absalom Sprague, a thin lank man with a melancholy expression and extremely furtive eyes. As soon as I could, I got Simon Claude to myself and sounded him tactfully on the subject.
He was full of enthusiasm. Eurydice Sprague was wonderful. She had been sent to him directly in answer to prayer. She cared nothing for money, the joy of helping a heart in affliction was enough for her. She had quite a mother's feeling for little Chris. He was beginning to regard her almost as a daughter. Then he went on to give me details how he had heard his Chris's voice speaking, how she was well and happy with her father and mother. He went on to tell other sentiments expressed by the child, which in my remembrance of little Cristobal seemed to me highly unlikely. She laid stress on the fact father and mother loved dear Mrs. Sprague. But, of course, he broke off, you are a scoffer, Peth Eric? No, I am not a scoffer. Very far from it. Some of the men who have written on the subject are men whose testimony I would accept unhesitatingly, and I should accord any medium recommended by them respect and credence. I presume that this Mrs. Sprague is well vouched for. Simon went into ecstasies over Mrs. Sprague. She had been sent to him by heaven. He had come across her at the watering place where he had spent two months in the summer. A chance meeting, with what a wonderful result. I went away very dissatisfied. My worst fears were realized, but I did not see what I could do. After a good deal of thought and deliberation I wrote to Philip Garrett who had, as I mentioned, just married the eldest Claude girl. Grace. I set the case before him, of course, in the most carefully guarded language. I pointed out the danger of such a woman gaining ascendancy over the old man's mind. And I suggested that Mr. Claude should be brought into contact if possible with some reputable spiritualistic circles. This, I thought, would not be a difficult matter for Philip Garrett to arrange. Garrett was prompt to act. He realized, which I did not, that Simon Claude's health was in a very precarious condition, and as a practical man he had no intention of letting his wife or her sister and brother be despoiled of the inheritance which was so rightly theirs. He came down the following week, bringing with him as a guest no other than the famous Professor Longman. Longman was a scientist of the first order, a man whose association with spiritualism compelled the latter to be treated with respect. Not only a brilliant scientist, he was a man of the utmost uprightness and probity. The result of the visit was most unfortunate. Longman, it seemed, had said very little while he was there. Two seances were held, under what conditions I do not know. Longman was noncommittal all the time he was in the house, but after his departure he wrote a letter to Philip Garand. In it he admitted that he had not been able to detect Mrs. Sprague in fraud, nevertheless his private opinion was that the phenomena were not genuine. Mr. Garand, he said was at liberty to show this letter to his uncle if he thought fit, and he suggested that he himself should put Mr. Claude in touch with a medium of perfect integrity. Philip Garrett had taken this letter straight to his uncle, but the result was not what he had anticipated. The old man flew into a towering rage. It was all a plot to discredit Mrs. Sprague who was a maligned and injured saint. She had told him already what bitter jealousy there was of her in this country. He pointed out that Longman was forced to say he had not detected fraud. Eurydice Sprague had come to him in the darkest hour of his life, had given him help and comfort, and he was prepared to espouse her cause even if it meant quarreling with every member of his family. She was more to him than anyone else in the world. Philip Garrard was turned out of the house with scant ceremony, but as a result of his rage clothes own health took a decided turn for the worst. For the last month he had kept to his bed pretty continuously, and now there seemed every possibility of his being a bedridden invalid until such time as death should release him. Two days after Philip's departure I received an urgent summons and went hurriedly over. Claude was in bed and looked even to my layman's eye very ill indeed. He was gasping for breath. This is the end of me, he said. I feel it. Don't argue with me, Path Eric. But before I die I am going to do my duty by the one human being who has done more for me than anyone else in the world. I want to make a fresh will. Certainly, I said, if you will give me your instructions now I will draft out a will and send it to you. That won't do, he said. Why, man, I might not live through the night. I have written out what I want here, he fumbled under the pillow, and you can tell me if it is right. He produced a sheet of paper with a few words roughly scribbled on it in pencil.
It was quite simple and clear. He left £5,000 to each of his nieces and nephew, and the residue of his vast property outright to Eurydice Sprague in gratitude and admiration. I didn't like it, but there it was. There was no question of unsound mind, the old man was as sane as anybody. He rang the bell for two of the servants. They came promptly. The housemaid, Emma Gaunt, was a tall middle-aged woman who had been in service there for many years and who had nursed Claude devotedly. With her came the cook, a fresh buxom young woman of thirty. Simon Claude glared at them both from under his bushy eyebrows. I want you to witness my will. Emma, get me my fountain pen. Emma went over obediently to the desk. Not that left-hand drawer, girl, said old Simon irritably. Don't you know it is in the right-hand one? No, it is here, sir, said Emma, producing it. Then you must have put it away wrong last time, grumbled the old man. I can't stand things not being kept in their proper places. Still grumbling he took the pen from her and copied his own rough draft, amended by me, onto a fresh piece of paper. Then he signed his name. Emma got in the cook, Lucy David, also signed. I folded the will up and put it into a long blue envelope. Just as the servants were turning to leave the room Claude lay back on the pillows with a gasp and a distorted face. I bent over him anxiously and Emma Gaunt came quickly back. However, the old man recovered and smiled weakly. It is all right, Path Eric, don't be alarmed. At any rate I shall die easy now having done what I wanted to. Emma Gaunt looked inquiringly at me as if to know whether she could leave the room. I nodded reassuringly and she went out, first stopping to pick up the blue envelope which I had let slip to the ground in my moment of anxiety. She handed it to me and I slipped it into my coat pocket and then she went out. You are annoyed, Path Eric, said Simon Claude. You are prejudiced, like everybody else. It is not a question of prejudice, I said. M.R.S. Sprague may be all that she claims to be. I should see no objection to you leaving her a small legacy as a memento of gratitude, but I tell you frankly, Claude, that to disinherit your own flesh and blood in favor of a stranger is wrong. With that I turned to depart. I had done what I could and made my protest. Mary Claude came out of the drawing room and met me in the hall. You will have tea before you go, won't you? Come in here and she led me into the drawing room. A fire was burning on the hearth and the room looked cozy and cheerful. She relieved me of my overcoat just as her brother, George, came into the room. He took it from her and laid it across a chair at the far end of the room, then he came back to the fireside where we drank tea. During the meal a question arose about some point concerning the estate. Simon Claude said he didn't want to be bothered with it and had left it to George to decide. George was rather nervous about trusting to his own judgment. At my suggestion, we adjourned to the study after tea and I looked over the papers in question. Mary Claude accompanied us. A quarter of an hour later I prepared to take my departure. Remembering that I had left my overcoat in the drawing room, I went there to fetch it. The only occupant of the room was Mrs. Sprague, who was kneeling by the chair on which the overcoat lay. She seemed to be doing something rather unnecessary to the chair's slip cover. She rose with a very red face as we entered. That cover never did sit right, she complained. My! I could make a better fit myself. I took up my overcoat and put it on. As I did so I noticed that the envelope containing the wool had fallen out of the pocket and was lying on the floor. I replaced it in my pocket, said goodbye, and took my departure. On arrival at my office, I will describe my next actions carefully. I removed my overcoat and took the will from the pocket. I had it in my hand and was standing by the table when my clerk came in. Somebody wished to speak to me on the telephone, and the extension to my desk was out of order. I accordingly accompanied him to the outer office and remained there for about five minutes engaged in conversation over the telephone. When I emerged I found my clerk waiting for me. M.R. Sprague has called to see you, sir. I showed him into your office. I went there to find Mr. Sprague sitting by the table. He rose and greeted me in a somewhat unctuous manner, 
then proceeded to a long discursive speech. In the main it seemed to be an uneasy justification of himself and his wife. He was afraid people were saying, etc., etc. His wife had been known from her babyhood upwards for the pureness of her heart and her motives and so on and so on. I was, I am afraid, rather curt with him. In the end I think he realized that his visit was not being a success and left somewhat abruptly. I then remembered that I had left the will lying on the table. I took it, sealed the envelope, and wrote on it and put it away in the safe. Now I come to the crux of my story. Two months later Mr. Simon Claude died. I will not go into a long-winded discussions, I will just state the bare facts. When the sealed envelope containing the will was opened it was found to contain a sheet of blank paper. He paused, looking around the circle of interested faces. He smiled himself with a certain enjoyment. You appreciate the point, of course. For two months the sealed envelope had lain in my safe. It could not have been tampered with then. No, the time limit was a very short one. Between the moment the will was signed and my locking it away in the safe. Now who had had the opportunity, and to whose interest would it be to do so? I will recapitulate the vital points in a brief summary. The will was signed by Mr. Claude, placed by me in an envelope, so far so good. It was then put by me in my overcoat pocket. That overcoat was taken from me by Mary and handed by her to George, who was in full sight of me whilst handling the coat. During the time that I was in the study Mrs. Eurydice Sprague would have had plenty of time to extract the envelope from the coat pocket and read its contents and, as a matter of fact, Finding the envelope on the ground and not in the pocket seemed to point to her having done so. But here we come to a curious point. She had the opportunity of substituting the blank paper, but no motive. The will was in her favor, and by substituting a blank piece of paper she despoiled herself of the heritage she had been so anxious to gain. The same applies to Mr. Sprague. He, too, had the opportunity. He was left alone with the document in question for some two or three minutes in my office. But again, it was not to his advantage to do so. So we are faced with a curious problem. The two people who had the opportunity of substituting a blank piece of paper had no motive for doing so, and the two people who had a motive had no opportunity. By the way, I would not exclude the housemaid, Emma Gaunt, from suspicion. She was devoted to her young master and mistress and detested the Sprags. She would, I feel sure, have been quite equal to attempting the substitution if she had thought of it. But although she actually handled the envelope when she picked it up from the floor and handed it to me, she certainly had no opportunity of tampering with its contents and she could not have substituted another envelope by some sleight of hand, of which anyway she would not be capable, because the envelope in question was brought into the house by me and no one there would be likely to have a duplicate. He looked round, beaming on the assembly. Now, there is my little problem. I have, I hope, stated it clearly. I should be interested to hear your views. To everyone's astonishment Miss Marple gave vent to a long and prolonged chuckle. Something seemed to be amusing her immensely. What is the matter, Aunt Jane? Can't we share the joke, said Raymond. M. R. Patherick's story is a catch. So like a lawyer. Ah, my dear old friend. She shook a reproving head at him. I wonder if you really know, said the lawyer with a twinkle. Miss Marple wrote a few words on a piece of paper, folded them up and passed them across to him. Mr. Patherick unfolded the paper, read what was written on it and looked across at her appreciatively. My dear friend, he said, is there anything you do not know? I knew that as a child, said Miss Marple. Played with it too. I feel rather out of this, said Sir Henry. I feel sure that Mr. Patherick has some clever legal ledger to main up his sleeve. Not at all, said Mr. Patherick. Not at all. It is a perfectly fair straightforward proposition. You must not pay any attention to Miss Marple. She has her own way of looking at things. The lawyer shook his head. I will go on where I left off. I was dumbfounded and quite as much at sea as all of you are. I don't think I should ever have guessed the truth, probably not, but I was enlightened. It was cleverly done too. 
I went and dined with Philip Garrett about a month later, and in the course of our after-dinner conversation, he mentioned an interesting case that had recently come to his notice. I should like to tell you about it, Path Eric, in confidence, of course. Quite so, I replied. A friend of mine who had expectations from one of his relatives was greatly distressed to find that that relative had thoughts of benefiting a totally unworthy person. My friend, I am afraid, is a trifle unscrupulous in his methods. There was a maid in the house who was greatly devoted to the interests of what I may call the legitimate party. My friend gave her very simple instructions. He gave her a fountain pen, duly filled. She was to place this in a drawer in the writing table in her master's room, but not the usual drawer where the pen was generally kept. If her master asked her to witness his signature to any document and asked her to bring him his pen, she was to bring him not the right one, but this one which was an exact duplicate of it. That was all she had to do. He gave her no other information. She was a devoted creature and she carried out his instructions faithfully. He broke off and said, I hope I am not boring you, Path Eric. Not at all, I said. I am keenly interested. Our eyes met. My friend is, of course, not known to you, he said. Of course not, I replied. Then that is all right, said Philip Garand. He paused then said smilingly, you see the point? The pen was filled with what is commonly known as evanescent ink, a solution of starch in water to which a few drops of iodine has been added. This makes a deep blue-black fluid, but the writing disappears entirely in four or five days. Miss Marple chuckled. Disappearing ink, she said. I know it. Many is the time I have played with it as a child. And she beamed round on them all, pausing to shake a finger once more at Mr. Path Eric. But all the same it's a catch, Mr. Path Eric, she said. Just like a lawyer. The End